I want to juxtapose Nala Ray, the porn star turned Christian, with Jordan Peterson. Now this is gonna this is gonna upset some of you, but I think it's important to say this because there are some very important, some curious things that are happening. So please stick with me. Of the many news items circulating on social media these days, the conversion, alleged conversion of porn star Nala Ray to the Christian faith has dominated discussion among Christians. OF corn star finds Jesus, but no one is talking about this. And she came out and she said that she was leaving it all behind. OnlyFans girl deletes her account after being saved by Jesus Christ. There's been a lot of hand-wringing over the authenticity of her profession of faith. Is it real or is she just using it to up her social media game? But how is it that the people who had criticized her for that don't criticize Jordan Peterson, who rejects Jesus Christ, but is profiting off of his rejection of Jesus Christ? The idea that we're discussing on this episode of Ideas Have Consequences is grace and what it means to be a Christian. Let's consider a tweet by Laura Loomer. Now, I want to say from the outset here that I don't know Laura Loomer. I've never met her. I've never listened to one of her podcasts. I know very little about her. Um, but I was taking a break, some of you will know, from social media for about three weeks. And this tweet popped up. And this is what Miss Loomer says. She says, these only fans girls, which is to say a porn star, um, uh, Anala Ray, the the former porn star, she was uh, apparently on a website called Only Fans. And Laura Loomer here says, these Only Fans girls can pray their slutty behavior away all they want. They will never be respectable no matter how much they cry to God. Praying to be a respectable person doesn't work once you do sex work. It's best that we shun women like this from society forever. Wow. Now, it's important to note, as some have pointed out to me on social media, that Laura Loomer is Jewish. So she isn't a Christian, and therefore I'm not trying to hold her to a Christian standard. But I do want to use this particular tweet because, first of all, it provoked me. When I saw this, someone had pointed this out to me. It's what made me decide to come back from my social media break because I thought I really want to respond to this because I thought it was an awful, hateful tweet. And again, she's Jewish, but it's so anti-Christian in all of its sentiment. But what I found particularly provoking is that while many Christians rightly pointed out to Miss Loomer that this was an awful tweet, there were some Christians who seemed to agree with this. And, um, seem to be sort of reveling in this kind of sentiment here. The view that Laura Loomer is expressing here is no grace if you have uh, committed this sin. There's no coming back for you. It's done. It's over. Forget about it. God had, there's no place in the kingdom for you. Now, again, Laura Loomer is Jewish, but I want to point her so she doesn't accept the New Testament, but I would want to point her to the Old Testament where we have a figure like Rahab. I mean, Rahab, who is in the line of Jesus, who she doesn't accept, but nonetheless is held up in the Old Testament Jewish scriptures as a great model and hero of the Christian faith. So, I mean, that's not even consistent with her own uh, expressed religious views. But to Christians, I would want to point out to someone like Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, uh, who is a hero of the Christian faith and who Jesus himself obviously redeemed. Um, I mean, these were the very people that Jesus hung out with when he was here on earth. It wasn't with the religious folk. It was with these sorts of people. But we're going we're gonna to come back to this. There's a very common sense reason gold is pushing to an all-time high right now. Actually, there are several reasons. The cost of goods continues to rise despite interest rate controls by the Fed. I mean, since January 21, cost of living is up 17.9%. The national debt continues to skyrocket, now above $34 trillion, causing many to wonder when this house of cards will come crashing down. 
and a presidential election this year that will have massive implications on the future of this country. All of this adds up to instability and uncertainty, and that is why so many Americans are turning to Birch Gold Group. Have you diversified your savings yet? Secure a portion of them with gold from Birch Gold. Text IDEAS to 989898 and get your free info kit. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. With an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau and tens of thousands of happy customers, you can count on Birch Gold to do the same for you. Just text IDEAS to 989898 to claim your free info kit and to protect your savings from uncertainty today. Okay, I want to illustrate how what Laura Loomer is doing here is exactly like what the woke mob does. Now, what I have here are, I just looked around the house to find something that I could use to make my point to you. Uh, these are my granddaughter's building blocks. And if I could, I would have painted them so as not to confuse you with the, the letters and numbers and any symbols that might be on them. So just ignore that. But I'm told that these have been around generationally, so I'm not allowed to do that. I should also state that I'm colorblind, severely apparently, and so I might confuse the colors. <laughs> but this is a linear, linear representation of a given life. My green building blocks, those represent just your normal, everyday, decent life. The red ones represent those sins that you have committed, offenses against God. Again, sins. And my yellow ones represent mistakes, not sins, mistakes, errors that you've made. You know, you, you, um, you know, wrecked uh, your your dad's car, or you, you know, that time that you were playing with your um, your mother's figurines and you broke one of them. That that's a personal example. I did that. Made my mother not very happy. But the way woke media works is that anyone who is a target of theirs, they want to tell their story uh, in as black a narrative as possible. So what they do is this. They remove anything good that might be said about an individual and string together the story in a way that, that uses facts to tell a non-factual narrative. So to use an extreme example, let's take Donald Trump, somebody everyone will know, and you certainly have seen media examples of what I'm going to going to say here they will say uh, they will use the fact of stormy daniels the the fact of you know an incident with a, a miss universe uh, contestant or miss usa or something um, maybe a poor investment that he made back in the 80s or 90s and then they will put all of those together removing everything else to tell his story in a way that's very dark, that's very sinister. This is what they do. This is what they did with my my uh, are doing now with the guest that I had on, you know, very recently, Lawrence Fox, the British actor and activist. They're telling his story just like just like this. They're saying, oh, he's been through a very ugly public divorce, and his wife is speaking out against him, and he's a in this case, um, he's. Uh, uh, you know, failed candidate for mayor and, you know, this TV series didn't work out or whatever. And they string all of that together in a way to make him look as bad as possible. Now, they do exactly the opposite with those they want to build up. In the case of, in the case of uh, you know, let's say a, a Joe Biden, they try to put it like this. And I actually, if I could, I was spray painted these uh, a black to represent um, lies. They just, just simply lie in that case. But this is the way the woke mob works. That's what they do. They, they um, uh, only see you through the lens. That is anybody who is, uh, you know, who is a, a target for them. They only see you through the lens of negativity because they want, of course, to destroy you. And that's exactly what Laura Loomer has done here for this woman. Uh, would she prefer that this lady just continue her career as a porn star? Or is there something to be celebrated in the fact that the woman has converted, that she has given her life? Again, allegedly, I don't pretend to know. I haven't seen any interviews with Nala Ray. Not interested 
as it relates to our point today. The fact is that Laura Loomer's tweet applies to anybody who might seek forgiveness, uh, whether it's Nala Ray or it is someone else. So that's an example of what Christianity is not. It's an example of grace not applied of the way we shouldn't do things. And this is a key difference between Christianity and woke ideology. It fascinates me how many, how many Christians, how many pastors confuse the Christian faith with social justice. They think, you know, that, that term itself has been used to seduce so many Christians into thinking there's something Christian about social justice when there isn't. It's actually Marxist. We've said that many times on ideas have consequences. But if I were to distill for you a very key difference between woke ideology, social justice, and the Christian faith, it is this. The Christian faith is about redemption. Woke ideology is about retribution. It's vindictive. It is, the, it is Laura Loomer's tweet. It is, there is no coming back for you. You are, re, you are ruined for all time. It's about leveraging guilt, both manufactured and real, for the purpose of seizing power. There's no grace in woke ideology. None. And you're seeing that playing out in the Southern Baptist Convention where they're finding, you know, uh, uh, sins committed or perceived sins committed by this or that pastor or this or that leader or individual uh, and then holding it against them forever, forever. There's nothing Christian in that. Nothing Christian in that. That's satanic, actually. Uh, that, we are told, is exactly what, what the devil himself does. He's called the accuser for a reason, because he continually accuses. And going back to my, uh, uh, my linear representation of a life, Satan wants to tell you, this is who you are. This is all you are. You are worthless. No one cares about you. Um, uh, no one thinks you're a good person. You know you're not a good person. You're an awful human being. And our Lord, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, he says, no, you're this. You're this. You're good. Not because you're intrinsically good. Jeremiah 17, 9 says you're not. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? But because you're covered in the blood of the Lamb. And I see you as righteous because I see you through the lens of my son's accomplished work on the cross. This is so important. Now, I know that some of you aren't believers, and you have to forgive me um, for doing a little preaching this morning. But I do want you to understand this key difference between woke ideology, which is satanic, and between that which is truly Christian. The Lord says, when you convert, when you give your life to him, he says to Anala Ray, if she is sincere, I throw your sins in the sea of forgetfulness and I remember them no more. Uh, meaning, not that he doesn't actually remember um, what you did, but the point is, it's no longer held against you. He sees you as a new creation the information I'm about to share with you might shock you. Right now, there is a silent epidemic affecting 100 million Americans that nobody wants to talk about. It's called fatty liver. We throw everything at our livers. Cholesterol, alcohol, toxins, heavy metals, statins, cigarettes. That's why so many of us have a sluggish, fatty liver that makes us gain weight and lose energy. Fatty liver also affects our sleep quality and may be a risk to our heart health. That's why it's important to start protecting your liver today. You can do so with Liver Health Formula. It's an all-natural supplement which contains 11 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver. This company already has helped more than 2 million fellow Americans with their products. Try Liver Health Formula by going to getliverhelp.com forward slash Larry and claim your free bonus gift. That's getliverhelp.com forward slash Larry. Now, this brings us to Jordan Peterson. I've been fascinated by Jordan Peterson uh, for a variety of reasons, but not the least of which because he has kind of shifted in his public persona, in his public, the way he's positioned in the culture from being a, um, 
a psychologist, a non-Christian psychologist who had a certain kind of um, affinity for the Christian faith, saying some very good things, uh, promoting truth, attacking ruthlessly uh, the woke mob, something that I've appreciated and many others. He's gone from that to now he has shifted to where he is now becoming coming to be seen as almost an apologist for the Christian faith. There are Christians who are who are kind of elevating him to a place where he doesn't belong um, as some sort of Christian theological sage, that he has something to offer on this. And he's been teaching scripture. He's been te- teaching the Bible. And now he's going around uh, on a book tour promoting a book called We who wrestle with God. He's selling a book about God, and uh, and Christians are buying it. Now, <laughs> I, I find that interesting for reasons that we will discuss here in a moment. But Peterson, just this past week, he had something very interesting to say about Richard Dawkins. And um, we talked about Richard Dawkins just a few um, days ago on Ideas Have Consequences. And we played this clip, but I want to play it again just to remind you of what it was that Dawkins said. I do think that we we are culturally a Christian country. I'm, I call myself a cultural Christian. I find that I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do not believe a single word of the Christian faith. Okay, so here's Dawkins stating that he's a cultural Christian, um, but and notice what he says at the end there. He re- he does not believe a word of it. He rejects all of it. Now, this is what Jordan Peterson had to say about this. Your belief structure is permeated by the implicit beliefs. Dawkins believes in the truth. He believes in the redeeming power of the truth. Mm-hmm. He believes in the redeeming power of the communicated truth. Yeah. Well, there's no difference between that and worshiping the word, the divine word. It's the same thing. It, and it, if that wasn't the case, the scientific enterprise wouldn't have emerged out of the Christian ethos. Dawkins, though he doesn't know it, is mostly a Christian, and so is Harris. Dawkins is mostly a Christian and doesn't know it. Hmm. Well, there are two parts to Peterson's commentary that I want to focus on. And the first part is just that, that according to Peterson, Dawkins is mostly a Christian, but just doesn't know it. And the second part is that he says that seeking truth is the same thing as worship of the, quote, divine word. Now, this is highly problematic, and you're going to see how this relates back to um, to Nala Ray here shortly. But in the first instance, this idea that Dawkins is mostly a Christian and doesn't know it, you might think that what Peterson there meant is that Dawkins' own intellectual assumptions rest upon Christian foundations though he really doesn't acknowledge the fact. And I've said that many times. I said it in my book, The Grace Effect, which is sitting right here, um, a book I wrote more than a decade ago, um, that Dawkins Dawkins is inhaled so deeply of a Judeo-Christian worldview that he doesn't even, he doesn't even acknowledge, uh, recognize the fact that he has done so and that it influences the way he perceives the world morally, his science, and otherwise. But anyway, um, that's not what Peterson meant. I've received many messages from the posse that you guys do not get notified when new episodes come out on YouTube, even though you might have been ringing that bell icon. It's no secret that we are covering sensitive topics here on YouTube that these mega corporations don't really agree with. In other words, they have reasons to suppress what we're saying on this platform. You might not know this, but I have a weekly newsletter that will notify you when their new episodes of Ideas Have Consequences. This is the best way to stay up to date on all that I'm doing. You'll get new episodes, documentaries, articles I'm writing, courses, and other exclusive content straight to your inbox every week.
Go to join.larrytaunton.com. That's join.larrytaunton.com to join the newsletter, or you can simply look for the link in the description below this video. Back to the podcast. He's making it clear that he's not just talking about, you know, intellectual um, ascent, uh, influence from the Christian faith, but he say, he uses the phrase the divine word, not just not just words, not just ink and paper, but the divine word. Uh, Peterson is here talking John one one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about God. Um, and when a woman tweeted Peterson a clear definition of what it means to be a Christian, Peterson instead of clarifying that he wasn't talking about salvation. He mocked her. Let's, let's, let's take a look at that. It's from Jada Franzen. Jada Franzen says this, You can't be a Christian and not know it. To be a Christian, you must receive the Holy Spirit and become regenerate in your redemptive faith in Jesus Christ, whom you boldly and unashamedly profess to be your Lord and Savior. You must be born again. John 3, 7. Neither of you are Christians. Now, there was nothing snarky in what she says here. She is clarifying for those people who are reading on, on Twitter, on X, and there are a lot of them, what Peterson has to say about being a Christian. She's saying, no, you're wrong. He's not mostly a Christian. Uh, being a Christian is an event. It's not a process. Um, you're either pregnant or you're not. It's You're not sort of pregnant. And so she's pointing out here, rightly to anyone who's reading here don't buy into what peterson is telling you here because it's nonsense being a christian is different from what he's talking about here and she has scriptural references but here's peterson's reply so peterson could have come back and said you know what i actually wasn't talking about salvation i was talking about dawkins intellectually is mostly christian in his thinking he just doesn't know it. But that's not what Peterson does. He comes back and he dunks on her. And he says, you're the most fun kind of Christian. Wow. Wow. And at the time that I took the screenshot of this tweet, it had been up for two hours, and you will see in the bottom right-hand corner there that it had 200,000 views, meaning that Peterson mocked her and held her up, tossed her to his own followers that they might do the same. And they did, of course. There were people who who came into the uh, to the comments section there and said she was unloving, that she uh, was not extending grace, and all these kinds of things. Ladies and gentlemen, she was speaking straight truth. Peterson was speaking nonsense. Nonsense. And just... To drive home the point further, Dawkins himself did not understand Peterson to be just referring to him intellectually. Here's what Dawkins tweeted in reply. My team sent me the following clips of Jordan Peterson. He says, I'm a Christian, although I don't know it. Well, I certainly don't know it. Now, knowing Richard Dawkins, I can tell you a, a funny little story about Richard we were doing a big debate at Oxford University, the Oxford Museum of Natural History. You will find this on my channel, Ideas Have Consequences. And um, at one point in that debate, Dawkins said, and this is uh, close to a quotation, um, a strong case could be made for a deistic sort of God. Not a case that I would accept, but it's a serious discussion that we could ha have. That was, that was what he said during the debate. Well, afterwards, I had this lengthy exchange with Dawkins because he was upset that some had interpreted that, media had interpreted that to mean that he was, quote, evolving, which is what um, the spectator of what one of their headlines said, which was quite funny. It was very humorous that he was moving from his uh, strict atheist position to now acknowledging that a strong case could be made for a deistic sort of God. But I kept reassuring Richard throughout that lengthy, bizarre exchange, Richard, I think your reputation as an atheist is intact. <laughs> I don't think anybody thinks that you've converted. 
I don't think you have to worry about that. I can assure you that Richard Dawkins is not a Christian at the time that I am uh, speaking to you. Uh, in this, hopefully that will change. Hopefully that will come. But he's here responding to Peterson and saying, "What do you mean? I'm 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 mostly a Christian and don't know it. I am definitely not. I am not." So here is here is Dawkins pushing back on Peterson. And what I think is interesting is that Dawkins has a better understanding of what it means to be a Christian than does Peterson. He knows what it means. He also says this at the bottom of the tweet, I'm still waiting for the in-person conversation Peterson keeps talking about. Jordan, if you're watching, I urge you not to have that in-person conversation with Richard Dawkins on what it means to be a Christian. If you're planning to do what you, you have right here to defend the Christian position while you yourself are not a Christian, Dawkins will destroy you. And not because he's more clever than you. You're a clever man. You're an educated man. So is he. But because you're defending a position that is indefensible. You're defending something you don't even believe. I've actually, I've seen this movie before. I moderated it. It was a debate between David Berlinski, who is an agnostic Jew. Has, that, that's kind of a contradiction in terms. He's of Jewish descent, though he is agnostic. He might call himself a secular Jew. But he was defending the Christian faith in a debate against Christopher Hitchens. Now, I moderated that. That was covered by 60 Minutes. It was also covered by C-SPAN. It was aired on C-SPAN. And what was fascinating to me is that David Berlinski, probably twice as smart as Christopher Hitchens. That's no knock on Christopher Hitchens, who is a very clever man. But David Berlinski is highly intelligent. He is, he is a real honest-to-goodness Renaissance man. But on this particular debate, for Hitchens, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. And it was because Berlinski was defending a faith he doesn't believe in. He rejects the central tenet of the Christian faith that Jesus is Lord, just like Jordan Peterson. Just like Jordan Peterson. It's very strange to me. Now, in the second instance of what, what Peterson says in this particular clip, He's saying that seeking truth is the same as worship of the, quote, divine word. They most definitely are not the same thing. In so doing, Peterson redefines what it means to be a Christian. He arrogantly tosses out 2,000 years of biblical theology of Christian tradition and understanding of what it means to be a Christian. And he says, nah, if you're a seeker of the truth, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Interestingly enough, perhaps unsurprisingly, Peterson's definition of what it means to be a Christian is just broad enough to include Peterson himself. I mean, Peterson, uh, it seems, sees himself as a seeker of the truth. It's, it's, like, it's like Christianity is, is the religion of philosophers. Uh, Plato and Aristotle, they were, they were Christians because they were seeking truth. You go on your, uh, your, your, your nightly quest and you become a Christian as a process, uh, as part of that process. You, you go on your, uh, your, your, your walkabout, your, your spiritual journey, and you become a Christian by default because you are out seeking the truth. Now, what I find very odd about this is because, <clears throat> like Laura Loomer, Peterson here, though he's going in the opposite direction, where, where Laura Loomer would want to ex extend grace to no one who has committed at least sex work in her mind. And there's an interesting discussion to be had about how we rank sins, which I think are very different than the way the Lord ranks sins. Uh, for Laura Luma, apparently sex work is the, uh, is the worst. I would suggest to you, biblically speaking, that is not close and not, and not true and not even close um, to the truth. But again, that is a, uh, that's another discussion. I'm reminded of something that C.S. Lewis said. He said, um, surely cruelty 
is worse than lost. And what C.S. Lewis was getting there, uh, getting at was hatred of your fellow man um, as, a, as, as the root of great uh, evil. Anyway, if she goes in the direction of no grace to, to people who have committed certain types of sins that make them irredeemable and thus should be shunned by society, as she says, forever, Peterson goes in the opposite direction and grace is like, it's like a, a, in a water bucket and just kind of thrown all over everybody, regardless of whether they're repentant or acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord or not. Scripture tells us that right up until the time when you die, God's grace is available to you. If Manasseh, Manasseh, who sacrificed his own children in worship of pagan deities, if he can be redeemed, I assure you any of us can be redeemed. If Moses and David, who were guilty of great sins, can be redeemed, that I assure you any of us can be redeemed. It is important that you understand this. However, Scripture is also very clear that grace, grace is only activated with repentance. With repentance. It is the activator. God doesn't just toss his grace out to people, offer forgiveness to people who are not repentant. And neither should you. That's the kind of conversation that I see in social media is people say, well, hey, Larry, hey, um, you know, uh, this particular woman here in her tweet, you're not being very gracious. God can save Richard Dawkins. He could be a Christian and not know it. No, he can't. No, he can't. I mean, God can save him if he repents. But if he doesn't repent, as John 3.18 tells us, he is under judgment. He is under God's wrath. I'm reminded of my wife and I when we were looking for a church some years ago. I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's more than 15 we attended a big Baptist church in, uh, we were visiting this big Baptist church in Birmingham, Alabama, and our kids were still at home at that time. And they're, they're sitting between us and she's anchoring the pew at one side and I'm anchoring the pew at the other, you know, you know how that goes. So all the kids are sitting between us and, um, the pastor calls, you know, at the end of his sermon, he calls for everybody to bow in prayer. So we do, and I'm leaning forward And he says this, he says, if there's anyone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, know this, that God offers his forgiveness to you here and now. You can be redeemed. You can be forgiven of your sins and be a new creation in Jesus Christ. However, if you are unrepentant, God has nothing for you but wrath. And I remember turning, Lori and I turning and looking at each other simultaneously and going, (laughs) it had been some time since we'd heard that kind of preaching. And it's biblically accurate. It's biblically accurate. So in the first instance, Laura Loomer, no grace. Jordan Peterson, I'm going to obfuscate the meaning of what it is to be a Christian so water it down as to make it meaningless. And God's grace extends to me, even though I, Jordan Peterson, and Richard Dawkins do not yield ourselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ, but I'm still going to get in the kingdom if there happens to be one. That's what he's saying. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. In this, in this Peterson is more like the woke mob that he quite rightly mocks because he's obfuscating meaning of words. And the meaning, the definition of words matters. I mean, it's Peterson who has trolled. I've enjoyed watching him troll the mob that says, what is a woman? What is a man? What is a man? Peterson mocks those people ruthlessly, And rightly so. But I'm saying, Jordan, you're doing the same thing. You've just come along and you've tossed... 
You've tossed 2,000 years of meaning, of Christian meaning, of clear biblical meaning of what it is to be a Christian. Romans 10.9 says this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So being a Christian, becoming a Christian, it isn't a process. Peterson says mostly Christian. No, you're either a Christian or you're not, Jordan. Being a Christian is an affirmative response to a specific proposition from God. If then, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Boom. That's it right there. Jordan, you're so off the rails here. And by the way, I invite you to come on the show and have a discussion about this very topic. I say this as someone who has admired much of what you have to say, but I, I'm not interested in your musings on Christian theology. You have nothing to offer. You don't believe in the Christian gospel. You have not become a Christian. You reject the central tenet of what it is to be a Christian. Jesus is Lord of your life. Until such time that you do, please spare me your, your literary musings. Please spare us uh, um, your... Uh, you're pontificating on Christian theology and biblical teaching. Is that not weird? How is it that the very people who would trash Nala Ray for profiting, and I don't know if she is or not, I think the allegation here is that she is using it to make the jump from being a porn star to becoming a kind of Christian influencer, that she's using her conversion to do that. How is it? I don't know. But how is it that the people who had criticized her for that don't criticize Jordan Peterson who rejects Jesus Christ, but is profiting off of his rejection of Jesus Christ? At least Nala Ray claims to have received him. How is that any different? He is profiting and being celebrated, making the book tour. If he hasn't been invited to speak in pulpits, I'm sure he has. He certainly will be. Because Christians, this is a sad commentary on the state of the Christian faith. The Christian Christians are so desperate for heroes, intellectual heroes, that the world admires that they elevate Jordan Peterson's to a place they shouldn't be. And I'm not saying that Jordan Peterson doesn't have good things to say. He does have good things to say, just not on Christian theology. Think about this for a second. I wonder how Jordan Peterson would feel if I, I mean, he's a psychologist, if I said I reject the central tenets of psychology, but I went around offering lectures on psychology. And then I wrote a book and did a book tour titled We Who Wrestle with Psychologists. Would he think that's strange? I think he would. That's where we find ourselves. In obfuscating meaning, what Peterson is doing here is, as I say, much like the woke mob that he criticizes, but it reminds me of a bizarre exchange that I had some years ago with Deepak Chopra. You know, because, because what Peterson is doing is he's making Christianity a kind of vague spirituality, a seeker of truth. And um, I had this, this strange, <laughs> funny uh, exchange on, on Twitter with Deepak Chopra, it went on, you know, for quite some time um, online, and we'll put up a couple of those tweets for you just because they're funny and they're kind of give you a picture of what I'm talking about. But here's one of them where he says to me, um, "In every being sleeps a god in embryo; its only desire is to be born." Now that sounds profound, superficially, and then you go, "What does that even mean? <laughs> what does that mean?" Frustrated, I finally replied to Chopra, Deepak, I have to ask, are you sitting under a black light and smoking a giant doobie while tweeting? I mean, these kinds of responses, they're so, they're all sale, no anchor. They're rooted in nothing. 
And in this instance, that's the way Peterson sounds. It's like being a Christian is being a seeker of the truth, man. That's what it is. But that isn't what it is. That isn't what Scripture says that it is. And I want to drive this point home. Becoming a Christian is an event. It's not a process. Our sanctification is a process, not an event. It's a slow thing that takes place. Becoming more like Christ, that's what we mean by sanctification. But justification, it is an event. You're either pregnant or you aren't. You're either a Christian or you aren't. There's no in between. There's no no sixty percent. You know, becoming a Christian. It's like a meter. You know, where you're uploading those updates on your your computer. You know, where it, it, it you know the you you see the the line going across the screen. You know, the upload is fifty percent, fifty five percent, sixty percent. So that's not what it is to be a Christian. It is an event, and um, obfuscating the meaning of what that is. Is uh, I I really think this is. I know some of you will say, "Hey, Larry, you're making way too much of this." Maybe this is, this is not a big deal, ladies and gentlemen. It is a huge deal to obscure the path by which someone can see the cross and understand what it means to become a Christian. What Peterson is offering is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. It's what a friend of mine uh, I recently called when we were discussing this, <clears throat> Chris Eastlip, if you're listening, Christless Christianity. Christless Christianity. I texted a friend before this podcast because I thought, you know, is there something that I'm missing here? And, you know... um, this is someone who's also in media, who's theologically savvy, but who I didn't ask if I could use his name, so I, I won't use his name. He probably wouldn't care, but I won't make that assumption. But again, I just said, hey, am I missing something about why so many Christians would be drawn to Jordan Peterson? Here was, here was his answer. He says, you're missing nothing. <laughs> Because your head is on straight, you know what you believe, you've raised a family, and you're generally joyful and content with what God has given you. I think Peterson is most attractive to young men who don't have their crap together and are looking for help outside the system that they believe has failed them, and the system has failed them. That's Peterson. Now, as to why many Christians have fallen for his weird, enlightened yoga shtick, that's uh, rather yogi shtick, that's because many Christians have only a surface level understanding of their own faith and therefore don't see the red flags presented by garbage theology. Now, this is someone, because I just want to drive this home throughout this podcast, who would say Jordan Peterson says a lot of really good things. And I can enjoy sitting on the sideline and watching him dismantle uh, the wokesters. I'm appreciative of that. But when he wanders into pontificating on Christian theology, I just want to say, sit down. You have nothing to offer there. You have nothing to offer there. It would be like me, you know, a colorblind man writing a book on the beauty of rainbows. You would rightly say, Larry, you've never really seen one. <laughs> My, my eyes, the doctors tell me, there's three wavelengths of light, and my eyes filter, I can perceive only two of them. There's a third one that no amount of squinting is going to enable me to see. I cannot see it. And the result is it distorts the way I perceive color. I had this funny exchange with my wife. These exchanges happen frequently. But I said to her, hey, where are my, where are those Charcoal pants of mine. She said, charcoal pants? I said, yeah, I've had them probably for about 10 years. I said, they're really comfortable, nicely broken in. We bought them at X store. Or they... She said, do you, do you mean your olive green pants? I said, no, they're great. They're, they're charcoal. And she looked at me with very sad eyes and she said, sweetheart, you don't have any charcoal pants. This was a jarring moment for me. 
because I had always thought those pants were charcoal. <laughs> so it's why she has to dress me to make sure I, she, she has to approve my daughter when she was around has to approve what I wear because I have no idea. Christless Christianity. Why this, why this matters, ladies and gentlemen, is, and it's very personal to me. I'm going to tell you a little story about my father. My father wanted Christless Christianity. He wanted cheap grace. <clears throat> he was not a believer um, throughout most of his life. I mean, my father wasn't an atheist, and I think if I'd ever told him I was an atheist, I think he would have hit me. <laughs> but my father was a, you know, he was a, he was a rough and tumble character, and um, he was one of those guys who was always railing about, you know, hypocrites in the church and wouldn't go to church, wasn't interested. And over the years, tons of people had shared the gospel with my father. I think he kind of enjoyed his minor local celebrity as an unbeliever because, you know, people would come and have coffee with him, you know, and want to share the gospel with him. Kind of like what I saw always happening, Christians doing with Christopher Hitchens. You know, when, the, when, when atheist Christopher Hitchens and I were taking our road trips together, we drove from his house in D.C. to mine in Birmingham, Alabama, and then a month later we went through Yellowstone National Park. You know, um, it was interesting because when we would be eating somewhere, somebody might recognize him, or sometimes they were people that I knew, let's say at an event, who would all want to be the person to apparently do what they thought God couldn't do, and that is to lead him to Christianity. But those would be some of the same people who'd be, uh, you know, offer zero grace to a fallen sinner um, within their own church. Their pastor just, you know, had just been caught in some kind of moral failing, but was repentant. And again, repentance is key to grace. It is the activator of grace. Without, without repentance, there can be no grace. And by grace here, I mean forgiveness of sin. So parade of people would come to um, to visit my father and share the gospel with him. He wasn't interested in going to church until he perceived he was dying. He was, smoked probably three packs of Pall Mall cigarettes a day. He was, had emphysema. Um, I think he knew that his time was short. And this became evident in retrospect because he suddenly was trying to reconcile certain relationships, broken relationships in his life. He began to talk a little bit differently. But he began going to church. He wanted to get right with God before that meeting, but only sort of. And so he told the leadership of that church, the pastor of that church, that he wanted to be baptized. He wanted to join. And this pastor rightly perceived that what my father really wanted was a stamp of approval. Charles, you're in. You've been baptized. You, you belong to a church. You're good with God. You don't have to worry about anything. You're going to heaven. But instead, they replied to him, well, hold on just a second. Let's see if you understand what it means to be a Christian. And part of that was they had a, a six weeks long membership class. Um, it isn't because it takes six weeks to become a Christian. It is rather that they wanted to clearly explain to you and to be able to take your questions on what it meant to be a Christian. Are you a Christian? and to what it meant to belong to a church. What is the function of the church? My father didn't want to do any of that. He wanted to be baptized, and he wanted to join the church. And this particular pastor and uh, the church leadership said, no, we're not going to do that because you've not been able to articulate faith in Jesus Christ. We, don't, we actually don't think you're a Christian. That made my father so angry. In fact, he was bitter over that. Bunch of hypocrites down there won't baptize, won't let me join the church. Trying to join the church, trying to do the Christian thing, they won't let me join. But you know what? That was such a favor to him. That was such a blessing to him because it eventually led him to faith in Christ. Because had they baptized him and let him join the church, which is what he wanted, he would have left believing, I'm good with God, and he'd have gone straight to hell. But instead, they said, nope, you're not right with God. You haven't repented of your sin. You have not yet yielded to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And on my father's deathbed, when he was looking into the pit of hell, I think, and he was crying out, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, 
almost incoherently, he began saying a prayer that I later realized he had memorized a little sheet of paper that I found later that is now in my Bible that he began praying. He had memorized it before he went into the hospital. The pastor of the church, the same church he tried to join, said, Charles, a prayer of repentance kind of looks like this. And he wrote it out with his own hand. And before my dad went into the hospital, he memorized that prayer and he began praying it as he was dying, literally on his deathbed. Deathbed conversions almost never happen anymore because people are so drugged. And he became a Christian. And I believe he sits somewhere in the nosebleeds of heaven. <laughs> the Apostle Paul says there will be some who will enter heaven as one who is escaping a burning house. <laughs> It's like you get out the door just, just as the building collapses just behind you. That's my dad. Dad, I look forward to seeing you in heaven. I look forward to that reunion. I look forward to a hug. But that's how he escaped. And you see, if they had, if they had, if my father would have gone to a Jordan Peterson event and loved it, and you know why he would have? Because he'd have come away going, I'm a seeker in God. Excuse me. He'd have come away going, I'm a seeker of truth. I believe in truth. I'm a Christian. But it's Christless Christianity because it does not involve repentance. Without repentance, there can be no forgiveness. There can be no grace. There can be no salvation. That, ladies and gentlemen, I think is incredibly important that we understand. A woman on Twitter named Sarah, and her handle is Bright Island USA. Bright Island, USA. Sarah, God bless you. This tweet nailed it. She said it better than I could have. <clears throat> she said, Peterson is a stumbling block to true and saving faith. He poses as one in awe of Scripture while disposing of its power to save. It's the same sort of error made by Thomas Jefferson when he published his own Bible, minus the miracles. Some prefer Jesus as the lamb, not the lion. God bless you, Sarah. That is spot on. Comparing Peterson to Jefferson, I think, is a brilliant comparison. So it's exactly right. We want to look to Jesus as a moral example. And you see, part of Peterson's problem here is that he perceives Christianity to be a system, like a code of ethics. A system, a system by which societies can operate. Ladies and gentlemen, the Christian faith produces systems. It does. Um, our system of law, of government, flows outward from the Christian faith. Science, it's a kind of system, flows outward from the Christian faith. But the Christian faith isn't a system. It's not a philosophy like Stoicism. It's not a to-do list like uh, Rick Warren's you know, purpose-driven life. It's not like the South Beach diet. The Christian faith is centered on a person. It is centered on a relationship with that person. It is centered on a relationship with God himself. To the extent that Jordan Peterson is a Christian is no more than the degree to which Richard Dawkins is a cultural Christian. Both of them are essentially cultural Christians. There are things about the Christian faith they can look to and say, oh, I like, I want to keep that. Without Christ, it's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. This reminds me of something, and I'll close with this thought. When I was in graduate school, <clears throat> if you've read my book, The Grace Effect There, you will, you will know this, and I'm sure I will probably do a full podcast just on this sometime. But when I was a gr in graduate school, I was required to read um, Max Weber, the German sociologist, his famed th um, thesis a book not very big, it's worth reading, 
called The Protestant Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism. That book, that's where we get the term, the Protestant work ethic. We get it from Max Weber. Weber was himself an agnostic. But like Peterson, like Jefferson, like Dawkins, he was saying, there are things about the Christian faith that I can appreciate. And what Peters, excuse me, what um, Weber was trying to answer in that book, and by the way, that book dominated histor historiography, the study of history, for the better part of a century. And it is gaining in popularity once again as we're seeing the decline of the West. Guys like Neil Ferguson and his civilization, his book, Civilization, the West and the Rest, kind of resurrected um, that thesis just a little bit. But I was ahead of him. <laughs> and... Um, that's because Weber, what he was doing in that book is he, again, published in 1904. Weber was trying to explain a global phenomenon, and that was the rise of America. He goes, here's a country that's, I'm paraphrasing, here's a country that's just fought its last Indian War, Wounded Knee, 1892, that has just vanquished old world Spain in a quick, six-week war and amputated from her, her colonies. This is a new country about to send their great white fleet around the world as an expression of power. The United States is flexing. Who are these people? Where do they come from? How is it they have so much power? And Weber's thesis went something like this. He goes, I got it. He says, it's capitalism that's driving America. What is driving capitalism? Protestant, specifically Calvinist theology. That's what's driving it. And he says, if you look back to the age of discovery, since the age of discovery, say the 16th, 17th centuries, the old Catholic powers have all been in decline. Spain, France, Italy, they're all in decline. And in ascendancy are all the Protestant powers. The, uh, the low countries, the banking countries, um, Great Britain, which dominated you know, 25% of the Earth's surface that literally the sun never set on the British Empire. And he says, and now here comes America. Wow. Where do these people come from? And he says, it's capitalism. And I, as a student, I was fascinated with Weber's thesis, but I decided that, that Weber was wrong. How dare I, as a young upstart student, think that Weber was, was wrong? When you're young and, uh, and naive, you're, you're allowed to, um, to do that. But I still do it. And I, I think that Weber was wrong because he was an agnostic. He didn't understand what animated the Christian faith. He didn't understand what it was. And that was because he didn't believe it. And he was missing the engine of Christianity, Jesus Christ and the grace that he offers. And there's a, coin, a term that I've coined uh, I call the grace effect. And the grace effect looks like this, that, that as we experience grace inwardly, we exhibit it outwardly. And when there is a significant presence of Christians within a society, it transforms the whole culture. It changes the culture. And this is the part that, that, that Weber missed. It's the part that Dawkins misses when he says, gosh, you know, I, I hate to see the decline of Christianity. It is the part that Peterson misses. They see a certain product of Christianity and they think, I want to keep that. But they fail to understand what is animating the product that they so appreciate. The light that Jesus Christ himself gives to mankind. Scripture says he gives us light in a couple of ways. He gives us rational light, uh, that is to say intellectual light, and he gives us moral light. But we can suppress that. We can put it under a bushel, as it were. And systems are born from that, but Jesus isn't a system. This is important. Society is changed. It is animated. It is transformed by the presence of Christians within that culture. But as Christianity is being driven from the public space and Christianity itself is in decline, we are seeing the loss of so many things that even an atheist like Richard Dawkins mourns 
or that Jordan Peterson, a, I don't know what you want to call him, some kind of spiritual agnostic, misses. This is where we are headed. And it matters so much because, Jordan, you have so many young men, as has been pointed out here. I texted a, a, a pastor friend of mine the same question. I, I seek wisdom from those people who, uh, whose opinions I respect before I do a show like this to see, you know, do you, do you think I'm on to something here? Do you think I'm wrong? And I texted a pastor friend of mine, and what he had to say was, was very important and very interesting. And that is, if I can find it here very quickly, he said this. <clears throat> Peterson is smart and insightful, but he's no Christian. I went to hear him. It was fascinating, like listening to Carl Jung try to explain the Exodus. What was even more fascinating was the response of the three to 4,000 people mostly men. They were riveted during his 70-minute lecture. That flies in the face of all that we, all the church gurus tell us we must not do in our churches. In other words, that you can't go long. He has obviously tapped into something in the masculine culture or the absence of it, but there is no doubt that he does not worship the true Christ. Jordan Peterson is attracting thousands of young men who are coming to him looking for practical advice on how to live and seeking significance and purpose and even spiritual wisdom. There's much he has to offer, but spiritual wisdom is not one of them. And that's why this is so important. Jordan, I do hope, again, I invite you to come and join us on the show. I would love to discuss this specific issue with you. Uh, because your influence, you have tremendous influence with a lot of these young men. And in this regard, you are leading them astray. I hope you will find your ultimate purpose. And this isn't because I'm better than you or smarter than you or anything um, to that effect. It is rather because I have come to understand that I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ, that I'm covered in the blood of the Lamb, and that gives me purpose. That animates my life. I hope you will find your ultimate purpose, which is in serving Him. And I want to close with my little illustration one more time. According to the devil, I think that's green. I think that's green. According to the devil and to Laura Loomer and to the social justice warriors, this is all you are. This is all you are. Once you've given your life to Jesus Christ, This is who you are. And how wonderful is that? But until such time as you do, our Lord has nothing for you but wrath. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton.